if it's between you and me, I'm going to be winning. It's that fight. It's that mentality. It's that drive to want to be successful and compete constantly. It's somewhat easy to get to this level and you think you've made it. But what actually keeps you here is having that mentality and that drive to want to be the best every single day. And that's how you can stay here. You made it, but now the work, the hard work really begins and you have to continue to have that growth mindset and wanting to get better and be the best every day. And if you have that mentality, you will stay and have a long career. But if you don't have that willingness and that drive, it's going to be a tough road. Today, I am sitting down with Allie Krieger. She is a pro soccer player, an Olympian. How are you doing today, Al? I'm great. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is such a dream to be here. Oh, man, a dream. <laughs> <Your> <laughs> blush. Um, spoiler alert, I'm kicking off the new season of the show with you. Oh, wow. No pun intended with the words kicking off. <laughs> well, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm so amped. I'm so amped to have you here. And I want to be the zillionth person to welcome you up to my neck of the woods. You and I are both in the New York area now. Congrats on your new chapter with the Gotham. Thank you so much. It's been such a great adjustment for us and such a change. I still haven't gotten warm yet. So <laughs> I don't know if that's ever going to change, but I am just cold all the time. It, it, I don't know if it changes, but I mean, we're, you and I are chatting on an absolutely beautiful day in New York, yeah. but I feel like it is like a ultimate tease lately. We get these like hints of 60 and then it's like, JK, back to 22. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's just like, I can barely feel my fingers and toes all the time. And we're like out of the training field and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till like end of March or maybe even, you know, end of April, early May, getting the season going in the hot weather. Well, you have nothing going on lately. I mean, aside from the fact that your daughter just turned one years old, you had this move, you guys are just like, I feel like all over the place. How are you feeling with trying to keep up with absolutely everything that's going on? We really are. I mean, we've, um, we're kind of comfortable in that chaos. I mean, I feel like we were so open to this move because um, we just wanted a change and I think it was time for a change. And so I feel like, it was definitely positive for us to get out of the environment that we were in and into um, this refreshing environment with a new team, a new culture, um, a new city to explore. And business-wise, outside of soccer, this is like a perfect city for us to, to be in, to um, you know get involved not only in the community with the team, but also as individuals and you know, get ourselves out there into the city and, and um, you know, go see other games and, uh, you know, interact with other athletes and, and sports and, and also just on the business side. And yeah, so it's been a great experience so far. The move was definitely hectic, but all in all, we're, we're super happy. What other sorts of business endeavors are you trying to take on at the moment? I mean, <laughs> there's actually a lot. Well, you know, we, we obviously want to advocate for our LGBTQ community um, and fight for issues that we, uh, we believe in. And I think that's also important. We're not only defined just by playing football. So we need to make sure that we get out in the community um, and we use our platform for good. And we use our platform to speak up for those who, who can't, uh, one, for themselves and, and maybe who don't have a similar platform that we do. So we obviously want to get involved um, with the community here and be challenged in a way because that's the only way that I feel like we can grow. And so it's been really exciting to kind of have these new experiences. So for those of that are maybe listening that aren't caught up to speed, your partner, Ashlyn, you married in mm -hmm. December 2019. Talk to us mm -hmm. a little bit about... I guess kind of coming into your own as a couple, obviously a lot of challenges that go hand in hand with not just playing together, but then kind of coming out in that really big way. So shed some light on that for us. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely new for us to announce our engagement. I feel like, you know, within our workspace, um, you know, we felt like we needed to be professional and, you know, kind of just focus on our job. We, had this feeling that maybe we wouldn't be as accepted uh, during that time. And so once we kind of said, basically, F it, we're going to be who we are and we're going to live our lives authentically, like, let's, you know, just um, go for it. And I, at that moment, wasn't, or in that time, I wasn't on the national team anymore. So I felt like it was, you know, 
a good time for us to, to be more open. Uh, with our fans, of course. I mean, our family and friends knew for a long time, but, um, you know, just like to say it out loud and to say it publicly that we were together, that we were engaged in getting married the following year. I think that was really important for us and also important for our fans and supporters to see that, you know, being with a, you know, a partner of the same sex is, you know, normal and that's okay. And that we can still be professional and be on the same, you know, in the same workspace. Um, so I think that was really a, a good moment for us because then from that moment on, we could give everyone everything we had. I think up until then, it was kind of like, oh, we're giving pieces of ourselves, but this isn't really all of us. And I think we were able to give our friends, our family, our teammates, our organization and our club everything we had. Um, without feeling that we were hiding anything, that we were, weren't were being our full selves. And so I think after that moment, it was like a weight lifted off of both of us and we just kind of kept on living our life. And the support from everyone, even our sponsorships was incredible. We even like, we got more sponsorships and, and, and attention than I think we ever thought of. You know, we weren't sure which way people were going to go and, and if they were going to accept us. And so that was definitely a, a really healthy experience individually, but as a couple. <laughs> and then moving on to the wedding, that was probably the last party that everyone went to before COVID. And so we were like so pumped to celebrate with all of our loved ones. And uh, it was so much fun. And I think putting that out into the world really then saved a lot of people's lives and maybe helped them along their journey of you know living their true authentic lives and so that was really inspiring for us and we wanted to do that not only for us and our family and friends but for the world to see that you know this is normal and um, the life that we live is is a choice and it's something that we thrive in and something that you know we want to share with everyone and and yeah it was a great a great year for us so interesting. There's so many things to double click on here. The first thing being that I'm sure in that like kind of build up to getting to the place where you felt ready to share this part of your life with everyone. It's not like just sharing it with 20 people. <laughs> it's sharing it with millions of people. So there were probably stories you were telling yourself of how it could go or what could happen. So that sense of relief, like I cannot even imagine. You know, when you like struggle for a little bit trying to find yourself in your 20s and your identity, I'm sure a lot of us can relate. And you're, you know, finding yourself through your sexuality. And, and I don't think you have to, you know, everyone has their own journey and it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Um, and I think that that part of our life um, was when we were working together on the national team. And I think we both were kind of going through our own challenges in life and both individually and as a couple and kind of trying to navigate through all of that. So I know it's really difficult for a lot of us to really, you know, find your identity and, you know, figure out uh, your sexuality. And so that whole experience kind of came to a head when we were going to announce that we were engaged. And I felt really comfortable and confident um, in us, but also in myself, that I was ready for this moment and that um, we can share now with the world and really be true to ourselves. And, you know, there's a phrase that I feel like I keep hearing pop up because of the pandemic. It's called empathy fatigue. And it's like you have so much going on in your own life and mm -hmm. you're like trying to show up for other people and it can be truly exhausting. I would imagine as beautiful and wonderful and so fulfilling it is to be someone that is helpful and insightful mm -hmm. and there to an extent for other people. Does it ever feel a little overwhelming or perhaps a little frustrating that maybe you can't be there in the capacity that you wish that you could for so many? That's such a great question. Um, yes and no. I feel like, yes, I want to help anyone who needs it. I'm such a people pleaser and I'm just, you know, I worry about everyone else's feelings more than my own. And so I feel like I, I want to continue to help everyone I can. But also you have to think about, you know, you can only control um, what you can control. And I think that if all of us can take a little puzzle piece in our life and really focus on how we can help those within that um, space, I think then 
all of us together are actually working in the bigger picture. So I feel like if all of us just kind of take care of our little puzzle piece and our little space, then actually, you know, everyone else is, is growing in, in a positive direction together. Um, not, you know, maybe it's unknowingly, but, you know, we can't control everyone and everything. And of course, I want to give more. But at the end of the day, I need some for myself as well. As another proud giver, I think that realization is something that can be hard to get to. But once you Mm -hmm. get there, it's like the most Mm -hmm. valuable moment to be like, I can only give so much to other people Mm -hmm. before I take the pitcher of water and pour some (laughs) into my own cup. Right. Absolutely. I totally agree. A hundred percent. And it might take you a long time to realize that it's taken me a, a long time to try and like separate myself and, and be like, okay, I've done what I, what I can. And I continue to do that. But I also can't forget about myself and make myself a priority sometimes because then you're right. You can't give, give, give and, and receive nothing in return. So, um, and at the end of the day, you're then empty and you're like, okay, well, how am I going to fill my cup in order to continue to give? So I agree completely. You also mentioned uh, earlier being left off of the roster in 2017. Let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit, perhaps before that, talking about just, you know, your journey with soccer. I know that you've been playing for one hell of a time. I had Carly Lloyd on the show, um, God, months ago now, but she had a lot of sentiments to share about like what it was like to be one of the older players in the league. And you've been going at this for a long time and been playing really well for a really long time. So kind of bring us back and talk to us about your entry point into playing professional soccer. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, this is my 16th year professionally. Um, I, you know, we didn't have a league when I graduated way back in 07. And so I wanted to continue to play. And I'm, ultimately, my dream was to make the national team. So long story short, I, that year was on the U23s. Uh, we went to Vasa, Finland and had a tournament there. And I think a lot of European coaches came to that tournament to recruit or just to see. And so I got a phone call from an agent um, of just a family friend. And he said, hey, would you want to come try out like for a couple of teams in Europe who are interested that they saw you this summer? I said, oh, my gosh, sure. Like, what else am I going to do? Play pickup with like my guy friends from high school like twice a week and hope I like, get to the next level. No. So I packed with two bags and I went to Frankfurt, Germany, and I ended up at training with like seven of like some of the best footballers in the world um which played on the german national team and they were incredible and also gina Lewandowski, who's my teammate here at gotham she uh gotham fc she was also uh at the at the field that day so i met her um and then five and a half years later i had some of the best experiences of my life both on the field and off the field that's when i kind of went through this whole finding myself and and kind of exploring I think I needed that um just kind of to be and be able to sit with myself and in my thoughts and and kind of you know picture my life and I really loved it there I had five and a half great years I ended up coming back because I wanted to help the NWSL start uh the league so that was my reasoning of coming back after so long but I mean I won Champions League there and all the titles that you can win at club level in Europe, which was fantastic. So that was a great start. So um, I, I, I loved it. And then I came home and started to play in DC, you know, for four years and then got traded to Orlando. Um, luckily, they traded me there because Ash was there. I don't know what would what would have happened if I would have, you know, been traded anywhere else. But and then, you know, I'm going to end my career with Gotham FC. So this has been quite the experience. I've learned a lot along the way. I've been in really good environments and maybe not so good environments. So I think I've taken the good and the bad and mixed it all together through my experiences now and just having the best four weeks so far uh, with any club team that I've been on. So this has been a great road, uh, a really tough road. You know, in between there, you've had some big time tournaments, World Cups and Olympics. But, you know, in 2007, I decided to take this big risk. I didn't know anybody. I just packed my bags. I said, listen, family, I'm leaving. I need to get out of here. I want to go explore something new, culture, food, people, environment. Let me learn something about myself, challenge myself. And I ended up taking a risk and then ended up, you know, 
landing me my dream job. So I, I'm so grateful for that experience. It's so funny, right? I feel like you hear that all the time. Someone says something like, I took a risk and it paid off. But so often people are afraid, afraid to take the risk because they're nervous about it going in the other direction. Do you think that you kind of were born with that level of gusto or was this truly something that was entirely out of your comfort zone? I think a little bit of both because I was definitely like, I don't even know what I'm jumping into. Like I have absolutely no clue, but like I'm willing to take that because here I'm, you know, I have goals and dreams that I want to accomplish and I don't think that this environment is going to get me there. So I needed to put myself in an environment where there were players who are better than me and kind of challenge myself in order to then grow. So I was willing to just like try something new. And just like you said, like, I feel, I feel like unless you take that risk, you're never going to know. And so the worst thing that could happen is if it goes south, I just come back. And so I was like, listen, I'll do something else. So I, I definitely had that luxury of, you know, making that choice. And they ended up signing me for two years and then the rest is history. But I, I think, yeah, if you don't take that risk, you'll never know. Talk to me about getting involved with the U.S. Women's National Team. Pia Suntaga came to one of my club club games uh, in Frankfurt and we were playing Potsdam and I was having to play against one of the best German players of all time, Lyra Bayermai. And I think she came to that game and, and watched, watched me play. Um, and then after that game, she was, I guess, just impressed with the game and, and the way we played and, and then invited me to that next camp. And so it was a bit of a surprise that I was going to be like coming into that next camp. And I'm sure she was just kind of, you know, seeing if I could fit with the rest of the team. Uh, and play at the level of the national team because it's a huge jump from club. It's definitely not the same. And so I went into that camp and I felt like, you know, I did well and she gave me great feedback and then continued calling me in. And then that was the year of the World Cup. So this was 2010. And then the year of the World Cup was obviously 2011 and that was in Germany. And so it was just kind of like a whole full circle moment. So luckily Pia came to one of the games um, when I was playing in Frankfurt and then, you know, the rest is is history. But along your journey, you also, uh, you mentioned some hard times, some of those hard times having to do with injury. So chat me through what that landscape has really looked like for you. I know you had a really rough fibula spiral fracture. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So I uh, was three days before the NCAA first round game uh, in college, and we played against a boys team that year just to prep us it was a wednesday i think we were playing friday and so it was just like at the end we just wanted to get a game in before um to prep us and uh, i just got tackled from behind unfortunately and got tangled up and landed down in a weird way and immediately broke my fibula i didn't know at the time um, but i definitely knew something was wrong and that turned into um missing the rest of the season uh, that year, we actually went to the Final Four. So I missed the Final Four, which I was so devastated. Um, but we played Megan Rapinoe in the semifinal uh, against Portland. And so we lost in TKs. And But it was, such a, it was such a great year. We were ranked, like, number one that year. But it was a real struggle because that was, like, probably one of my first injuries that I experienced and not being able to play and, you know, just in tears and just, like, going through it. And then the road was even longer because I ended up having uh, a pulmonary embolism from that surgery, the flights to the final four and over Christmas break. And then I was on, you know, birth control pills at the time. So I think it was like a perfect storm for that to happen. That was a whole nother layer. And then that was a six month recovery. So it was definitely a long period of time where I was away from the game. And so I struggled a little bit mentally and, and wondered if I would ever be able to play again. And so that took a toll on me and I was only 21 at the time and I still had another year left in school. And so I just fought back and listened to the doctors and the professionals as much as possible and was able to slowly get back into it. But it definitely put a dent in my, you know, mindset and mentality and it really challenged me. And you've dealt with other injuries since. I think so many people can relate to not being able to do the thing that they love that brings them so much joy. That's a huge part of their identity. What were maybe 
some of the tools that you harnessed either like mentally or like reaching out to help from friends and loved ones to get through these times where you felt so unsure of like who you were supposed to be or what you would do going forward if X or if Y? Yeah, it's it's difficult because you do start thinking that you're like, oh gosh, like what what if I can't play again? Like I don't, I'm not set up yet for the next step. You know, you're just gonna be forced to kind of just like do take another path, which I would have been fine with, but it just would have been definitely a period of you know grieving, I guess, uh, so to speak. And at that time, I was just focused on you know the next day. And I think a lot of people, it's difficult for people to not think ahead. Um, of down the road and envisioning that, okay, you're going to be doing this or that. But I honestly just focused on the recovery process and how can I, first of all, get healthy? Um, and then how can I slowly get back onto the field um, and uh, following the instructions from you know the, the medical staff uh, was really important. And then just taking one day at a time and having small goals each day and each week, rather than looking ahead and setting, you know, my long-term goals and kind of overseeing those weekly goals, because then you're just going to drive yourself nuts if you, you don't meet it at that specific time period. So I just tried to continue to get better every day, continue to get healthier and um, take one day at a time and, and not really put that pressure on myself. So it was definitely a slow process, but I feel like in the end, I, it like made me that much stronger. It's like some of these themes have been ones that have kind of interwoven throughout your entire story, uh, circling back to that 2017 moment. Where were you mentally when you realized what was going on with the U.S. Women's National Team? I was devastated. I was devastated because I was actually playing some of the best football in my career. And I couldn't really understand. And I know there was, you know, I was thinking of every which way, like, what could be the issue? Like, because, you know, my ability and quality on the field at that time was really good. And I felt very confident and very consistent. And at that level, my mentality was was good. And I, I just feel like there was no one that was really, truly like beating me out of my position. So I guess I, I didn't really understand. I, I know that not every coach is going to like you, you know, whether that be your playing style or maybe just because, it, you know, sometimes there's not even a rhyme or reason. Like, you know, not everyone's going to like you. But I thought that at that level, if you're the best in that position and you're playing well in club, then you deserve to be there. And so I wasn't really understanding that. Um, and, and even asking the question, I wasn't really getting a, an honest answer. And so that's something that I was really upset about um, because in this profession and a lot of us, you know, we're professionals, like you could just tell me, hey, this is what you need to get better at. This is what you need to do in order to be here. And then a uh, sure out like, you know, apply that and implement that in every training and get better and then bring it back into the camp. Well, there was just nothing. It was just crickets. Like it was just not even it was just made up. I felt like. And so then I thought it was somewhat of a personal vendetta. And so that was really a hard time period because I just never had an answer of why. Yeah. And so like, what can I work on in order to get back? And so that's why I think I struggled more um, because I was doing well. Um, and I had one of the best club seasons of my career with Orlando that year. And just, it wasn't clicky and I wasn't really understanding. So that was why it was so tough. There's kind of two parts to this. One is like, you get to a point where you start telling yourself all of these stories. So mm -hmm. if someone could have just kind of like put you out of your misery to <laughs> better understand what you could focus your energy on. The other thing really is you learning this important lesson of doing the best you could with what you had, right? Like it wasn't like you didn't have or deserve or earn the right to be upset in this moment. But then, as I know, because I know what's coming and maybe some of the listeners do as well, but like turning your energy into, okay, well, this is how it is now. So I'm going to push with that. Right. And, and like we talked about before, you can only control what you can control. So then, you know, it's not like I turn on the specific Allie Krieger that shows up just with the national team at camp. It's like, I'm always that same Allie. So in club, I made sure that I, you know, showed up every day, had a good attitude, 
you know, fought for my position, you know, earned week in and week out a position in the starting 11 on the, or just in the squad of 18 and just made sure that I was consistent and confident in every performance so that, you know, it, that's going to always be my mentality. You know, that's always going to be me, whether I'm just with club or national team or both. So I feel, I feel like that's what I focused on. I tried to just be more consistent and, you know, have great performances and then in hopes that the door was still cracked, you know, open, um, that I could get my big toe right in there and keep the door open for a little bit longer. For you during this time, also going through so much personally, did you have a hard time navigating your personal relationships because of the frustrations that you were experiencing with it in your professional life? Yes. Good question. I mean, I, I absolutely, it's really difficult when you're going through something. I think, you know, Ash, thank God for her. Like she stuck by my side and actually pushed me every day to continue to, you know, play well and um, do the right things in order to perform uh, at at the highest level um, and in order to not be ignored. And so I think, you know, she was such a staple, obviously, and helping me get back to the team. My family and friends are always going to support, but I did feel like I was pushing people away because I just wanted, you know, some time to try and figure out what was next. I actually tried to stay busy as much as possible. And I had my camps and clinics with AKFC. And I would do appearances, you know, and try to stay busy as much as possible in order to kind of, I guess, not have as much free time to think about what was going on. And so I started working on projects that I've always wanted to and, and you know, visit friends that I've always wanted to. And, and I was able to go to a wedding and different like family gatherings that I that I had never been able to up until now, you know, for years. And so I think that time was really healthy for me to kind of pick myself back up and, um, you know, do other things that I enjoy. And so all in all, yes, was it devastating, but it then, you know, helped me kind of have more time and quality time with family and friends that I, that I didn't before. Makes you think of that saying, like life is happening for you, not to you. And when you're in that moment, like, gosh, does it feel like everything, everything <laughs> is happening to you when it feels completely out of your control and the world is spinning and, you know, as it is. Right, right. For sure. This mentality that you're explaining here and like taking advantage of what could have been seen as like a very, you know, and was a disappointing situation is why you, and I've heard you talk about this before, are a one percenter. So talk to us about what that is. Yeah, I just think you're, you know, one percenter where you have, you're willing to do the work that not many other people are willing to do in order to stay at the top. So if it's between you and me, I'm going to be winning. It's that fight, it's that mentality, it's that drive to want to be successful and compete constantly. Um, and playing in this sport at this level, it's somewhat easy to get to this level and you think you've made it. But what actually keeps you here is having that mentality and that drive to want to be the best every single day. And and that's how you can stay here. So some you know, of my teammates and former teammates get to this level and possibly, you know, I've seen a handful of rookies do the same. They're just happy to be here. And I feel, you know, you're not going to last very long if you just have that mentality. Like, oh, I made it. But it's actually now the work begins. You made it, but now the work, the hard work really begins. And you have to continue to have that growth mindset and wanting to get better and be the best every day. And if you have that mentality, you will stay and have a long career. But if you don't have that willingness and that drive, it's going to be a tough road. It's it's about like not getting complacent, right? Exactly. And I mean, the other part of it really is that, yes, like this goes hand in hand with leveling up on the field, but it also goes hand in hand with like the other aspirations that you have. Like being a one percenter isn't just excelling in what is your profession. It's kind of channeling that same energy and using it to go after the other pursuits. Like we were talking about at the top of this, the the business things that you're interested in right now, you know, being an advocate for your community, it goes so much farther than just being on the pitch. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to take that into every piece of your life. Right. So it's like, you know, with my family, I'm like doing everything I can outside of the field in order to continue to have a roof over my head and fight for, you know, issues that I believe in that Sloan is going to be affected with one day and making sure that you, you know, put all of your effort into family and to your sport and um, make sure that that stays consistent. Um, so you're right. You can't get complacent and, um, it's definitely a journey, but it's all about your willingness and what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. There's that saying, uh, when you're tired, you rest, you don't quit. And I would assume that priding yourself as a one percenter, <laughs> there are many moments where, especially gestures loosely because of the last two years, like everything that's going on, burnout is real, like going from one team to the next team. Again, the chaos, you thrive in it, but it's a lot. So how does Allie take care of Allie? Well, I go to therapy. So that's, <laughs> yes. that's that, we love therapy um, here. Yeah, that's important. Um, I definitely communicate with my family and friends um, and check in and make sure that like we're all doing okay. I feel like that's really important. Making sure that, you know, everyone's on the same page and, and that we're all okay. Uh, I do think it's really important for Ash and I to make sure we make ourselves a priority. I know we do everything now and, and Sloan's a priority, but really I want her to see us with a smile on our face walking into the door after training and maybe a hard day. So I think it's okay to, you know, kind of do things uh, for yourself in order to bring that happiness into the home. And I can't forget that because I do carry a lot of mom guilt. And so it gets to be a little bit difficult. What does the mom guilt look like for you? Well, I feel like, am I there enough? Am I paying attention to her enough? Am I doing activities with her enough? Am, you know, am, am I away from the house like too long? You know, um, I don't know. It's just that that's what it feels like. And so you want to make sure you're there all the time and giving her everything and there every minute. But it's impossible because I also want her to know that it's okay to um, really love what you do. And, and I want her to be inspired by what we do. And, um, you know, working uh, in life is is really critical. And and I want her to know that we work hard at what we do and f in order for us to have what we have and, and a roof over our head. And so I think that's also important. So it's definitely trying to like let that go slowly. It's really difficult for moms. And now I understand what moms, you know, say when they say mom guilt, because you just want to make sure you're giving, giving, giving so that they are successful. But really you doing what you do best is enough. As long as we walk in the door with a smile on our face and excited to see her, I'm sure that's all she cares about. And I have to continue to remember that. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. you're describing, uh, you know, your tendencies and yourself ultimately as someone who is both compassionate and strong. When you think about what makes you both a good partner and mm -hmm. a good teammate, what would you say puts you in that bucket? On the field, I'm supportive and demanding at the same time. Talk to us about being both. Because I think you have to understand how your teammates receive information and not just expect them to receive it if you're like yelling at them. Like some of my teammates can handle that. Like I can demand a little bit more. But some teammates, you have to be a little bit more supportive. And so I think it's, you know, there's a lot of value in both and you have to understand each other in order to do that. But that also boils down to communication. And I think communication, not only in my personal life, but on the field uh, within the team is really critical in order to have a successful environment and a safe environment. And so I think communication um, and patience, which I've learned a lot being a mom, uh, I definitely try to carry that uh, through uh, with myself every day um, and into the team. And I think as I get older, because now I think since we were talking about this early, I think I'm the oldest player in the NBA now. <laughs> Um, you know, I feel like it's really important to have good communication and good build those good relationships. Um, because like you said, it's not going to last forever and you really have to enjoy in the moment. And so being supportive yet demanding, uh, in order to win a championship is key. And then I think having communication and patience every day, um, as just me as an individual is something that is really important, um, with all my relationships. Definitely. And to go back and bring this full circle, 
stemming from that time of poor communication, of you not knowing your place, of feeling frustrated with the U.S. Women's National Team, bring us to uh, what ultimately happened in, was it April 2019? Yes. Talk to Mm -hmm. me about April 2019. (laughs) So I was out on the soccer field in Orlando during like a double day. And I get back in uh, after the first training session. I have a text message from Jill Ellis. And I said, oh, gosh, like I haven't talked to her in I don't know how long. I'm like, what's going on? And so I took a look at it. And she said, hey, I'd love to catch up and, you know, let me know when there's a good time to chat, basically. And I, I didn't answer right away. You know, I let her sit on it for a little bit. And I went in and actually talked to my coaches in Orlando and just, you know, had asked if they had spoken to her because I was just wondering what it could possibly be about. They said, no, not yet, but we talked a little bit about potentially having an offer to go back to the national team. And I said, yeah, I I need to like think about it for a little bit, but uh, I'm going to give her a call back. And so I did on the way home after the second session, I told her that's when I would have time. And we talked a little bit and she had said, I'd love to invite you back in. Um, and we went on and discussed, you know, some things, but I just said, honestly, I'm willing to do anything for the team, whatever that is. I want to help the team be successful and win. And ultimately that is, you know, what I'd love to do. So yes, um, there was no really explanation, no communication on the past or anything. I just wanted to like, let that go because, I was already in a new place and a new environment and a new space mentally that I just wanted to continue to keep going in that positive direction. And so I was so excited to have the opportunity again because it was the last camp before, or maybe the second to last camp before the World Cup. And so I couldn't believe it. Um, And so I was just really excited to have the opportunity. And I said, whatever you need me to do, I'm, I'm ready to do. Ready to do it. And then, I mean, come soon after that to get to the 100 cap mark was just probably the most uh, beautiful moment for you. Yes, because I was stuck on 98. And honestly, it's not about the numbers. You know, for me, it's, it's just, you know, I was so proud every single one of those appearances um, to be a part of the team and help the team win. Um, but I... I definitely was hoping that I could kind of, you know, get those last two um, and feel, I think, more complete. Uh, Not that I, I wouldn't if I didn't get those, but it just somehow it was just lingering. And um, I felt like over the years um, and the way that I was playing, I had, you know, deserved that moment. And so... I think, yeah, it was a beautiful experience. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Every time you put on that national team jersey, it's an honor. And I wasn't going to um, let that moment pass me by. And and so, so excited that that is where, you know, that next chapter kind of began. You mentioned uh, your wedding being one of the last real great yeah. gatherings of 2019. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's so awesome. I, I watched the wedding video on Vogue, like everyone. Also, like, does it ever get old that someone's like, oh, I watched your wedding video on Vogue? No, but like, I have to tell you, we weren't even planning on having a videographer. <laughs> we weren't even planning on having we were like oh like I think the pictures will be just fine right so then like one of our wedding planners friends was like wait they don't have a videographer like I'll like we'll do it our timeline production company were like we'll do it and then they were like okay well we we found you know a videographer if you want to like you know they'll, they would love to do it for you guys and I said 100 percent that'd be great you know so we <laughs> not have even had that footage oh my god well the footage was stunning but it's so cool because you do see like such a beautiful moment with your friends and family standing truly surrounding you and then um i believe in there there's there's meg's speech and everything and it really highlights the beautiful relationships that you have in your life both with your family and your friends but also with your teammates who have become you know, just like family, why would you say the relationships that you have with these women are literally forever lasting? They are because you go through things with them that you can't even put into words, really. You can't, you know, share the deep emotional feeling that you go through with these women, you know, year after year and tournament after tournament. And just like 
a lot of people don't see behind the scenes of how hard it really is. And you don't understand it unless you're there and you're within the squad and the staff. And so I think that I will always have a specific bond and, and such a beautiful bond with each and every one of these players and, and women. And, you know, you build these lifelong friendships. And I think that is ultimately what is the best about our group um, and, and players uh, in the football community is that you build these lifelong friendships. And that's something that I am so grateful to take away. Um, not, you know, the championships and, and this and that. It's It's honestly about these friendships that you build with these women who – have these shared experiences that are, you know, the ups and the downs and the emotional, mental and physical um, battles uh, day in and day out is, is, um, and what we endure day to day is, is, you know, you can't really explain it unless you're there. And so that is why it's so special. Yeah. And I mean, the word battle kind of brings to the forefront the equal pay lawsuit, which what a huge moment recently for all of you women uh, trying to find, you know, your footing in this space to be recognized and given the the moment that you deserve. How did that feel for you after all of these years? Really great. Um, it's definitely a step forward. It's definitely a step forward. And I know that we might not see all the benefits from it, but that's something that we have always talked about. We want to leave the game better than where we found it. And so it's so important that our younger players and the youth um, have the opportunity to dream big and to get what they deserve. And so we'll keep fighting because we do deserve uh, more. And this is a win for all women. It's not just about the U.S. women's soccer team. It's about women across all industries who are fighting the same fight in their workplace, who are fighting for equity, equality, respect in the workplace. So this is a step forward and we are very happy about it. But we can always be doing more and the work will never be done. And so we will continue to fight every day. And now we have to get down to the club level and kind of have that, that same mentality and that same fight going on in order to get what we deserve. Yeah. And I mean, the equal rights definitely also extending to a lot of the work that you do with the LGBTQ community. Uh, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to maybe offer some sentiments to someone who is struggling to get to this beautiful place that you are in now, someone who feels so accepted and loved by her community, embracing yourself authentically as you are. For these people that may not be quite at this stage just yet, what is it that you mm -hmm. tell them during their struggles? That I think everything is going to be okay. I think living your truth really opens so many doors. And I think that it's okay to kind of take your own journey. You don't need to have a timestamp on when you express your sexuality or who you really feel you are. And there's, you know, no one saying that there has to be this special moment of you announcing it to the world. It's it's your own journey and in, in, in your own time, it's okay to take that time and and to realize that this is about you. And also, you know, if anyone has a problem with it, then it has a lot to do with them and very little to do with you. So live your authentic life. And, and once that, I think I can speak for Ash as well, once we kind of open that door um, and, and we haven't looked back, it's just been an incredible uh, experience for us. And, and the, the way that I feel now is, is just having that openness and honesty and authenticity to my life has been so accepting. Um, so on the other side of the door, you will be so loved in our community. Will it be accepting and can't wait for you to jump through? <laughs> we love that. We love that. Someone mm -hmm. right now comes to your Instagram page. They see this amazing footballer, a mom, a wife, joins of 922,000 people. When you look in the mirror, what is it that you see looking back at you? <laughs> I... Gosh, I see, I see a strong, confident woman uh, who uh, really cares about her family and her friends and wants what's best for the community that she lives in every single day. Right now, you have an opportunity to give the alley in 2017, going through that really big hurdle moment, asking herself all of the why, a piece of advice, looking back on it right now with the know-how and the wisdom and everything else that you have at this moment. What do you tell her? I mean, we spoke about it before. I, I think mainly 
just live your life authentically and and for you I think that if I could have have told myself 15 years ago that it's okay to just be you um, I think uh, I would have started living a lot earlier and um, two I think take that big risk because it could lead you to your dream job I might have four things. Uh, the third thing I would say is just put your cell phones down and explore the world. I think we miss a lot now because we are constantly scrolling through social media and we're really missing what is so beautiful around us and those moments that we will never be able to get back. Um, and four, control what you're able to control. Just that's your work ethic and your attitude towards something. And I think if you can keep that consistent and have that as a mindset, then everyone will be in such a, a happier place. What excites you right now, Al? My family, um, hopefully growing my family and then our NWSL season coming up. I'm so excited to be a part of this new team um, and this amazing group of people and footballers who have worked so hard to get this team in a place um, to really play and, and bring something special to the city. And so I'm, I'm so pumped about that. I'm pumped about it too, because hopefully I can come watch. Yes, you have to. You have Amazing. To. Yes. I'll have to come from Brooklyn. I am so grateful yeah. for your time. I'm so grateful for this conversation. How did the hurdlers follow along with you? How do they keep up with you? Give us all of your details. Okay, so I keep everything really simple and all the same. So Twitter and Instagram is Allie Krieger, and that's it. So <laughs> follow me on there. I don't really do TikTok, but we might be doing maybe TikTok soon. <laughs> Teasing a TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> I'm over at Emily Abadi and at Hurdle Podcast. Another hurdle conquered. Catch you guys next time.